YouTube too. So we have hi, the Zoom everyone. people here and the YouTube people. Yeah. So hi all to uh, welcome you to today's seminar organized jointly by Athens International Master's Program in Neurosciences and the Hellenic Initiative Against Alzheimer's Disease, HIAAD. For those uh, who are new in this seminar series, and uh, don't know about HIAD, I would like to give a, a brief introduction and some information. It's an initiative started about two years ago. And the major goal is uh, to implement the Greek National Dementia Action Plan to fight Alzheimer's disease using a range of approaches, one of which is the promotion of research in the field. HIAD brings together from Greece and abroad people with different backgrounds interested in fighting AD such as doctors, researchers, educators, entrepreneurs, and caregivers, and is coordinated by the Precision Medicine Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease at Johns Hopkins United States, and the Bioinformatics and Human Electrophysiology Laboratory at the Ionian University. Uh, the central objective of uh, this initiative is to promote uh, basic science research in dementia and Alzheimer's disease in Greece, by stimulating and expanding research collaborations. We hope to achieve this in part by organizing this monthly seminar series with invited speakers to exchange ideas and promote discussions, collaborations uh, in this very exciting field. Today is our great pleasure uh, to have Dr. Destruper uh, as an invited speaker. And uh, Dr. Destruper, uh, it's an honor to have you in this uh, seminar series. And I would like uh, now Spiros to uh, say a few things and do the introduction. We are looking forward for your presentation. Thank you. Spiros, you are mute. Bart, thank you very much for contributing to this series of um, seminars. Uh, now I would like to make a short introduction for you. Professor Bart, Bart Distrooper is the founding director of the UK Dementia Research Institute. He's a researcher in Alzheimer's disease and supervises laboratories based in, in, in UK at the Francis Crick Institute in London and in the VIB laboratory at the uh, Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Bart Distrooper's research is focused on translating genetic findings into mechanisms of neurodegenerative disorders and drug targets. He is best known for his work on the presinilins and gamma secretase, and more recently for his work on the cellular theory of Alzheimer's disease. He has published more than 250 excellent papers in journals such as Nature, Nature, Science, Science, Neuron, Cell, Cell, Ebo, etc. Uh, his career is steadily on the rise. He has more than 60,000 citations, an H index of 133, and an I10 index of 343. He was elected to the Academy of Medical Sciences Fellowships in 2020, and he has received several awards, including the Potamkin Prize, the MetLife Foundation Award, Award for Medical Research, Alois Alzheimer Prize for the highly prestigious Brain Prize 2018, and Commander in the Order of the Leopold I. Art, thank you again, and we are uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Uh, I feel it really an honor and a pleasure to speak for this audience. Uh, and uh, uh, I also would like to thank Spiros, uh, a, very, a friend and a colleague for many years. Uh, I've always liked to work with him and to collaborate with him. So uh, if he works for something, I like to support him. Um, so I'm going to talk about basically uh, our work on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you will see that 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 um, that we made a lot of pro progress. Um, and so, for, before before going really into the research, I, I want to make some some considerations. So, of course, the the research in Alzheimer's disease is driven by what is and what causes Alzheimer's disease. But there is a lot of confusion actually 
what we mean with Alzheimer's disease. And I, I, I even don't think that we, we, we have settled down on that discussion. So as you, for many clinicians mainly, but also for many basic scientists and certainly in the public opinion, Alzheimer's disease and dementia are considered the same. And so this has really led to a lot of misunderstandings uh, because when you treat dementia with drugs developed for Alzheimer's disease, then you might have problems to have positive outcomes because you, um, uh, many people with dementia have mixed forms of dementia with vascular components, with Parkinson disease components, with, uh, with frontotemporal dementia components, et cetera. And so I think it's very important to understand that what I'm focusing on is on Alzheimer's disease. And so, so it's, it's in fact the disease as it's defined by Alois Alzheimer, uh, but also by his colleague Fisher, uh, which described already 1906 the, 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 the definition of Alzheimer's disease. And um, I think that we can only speak about Alzheimer's disease when you have neuropathological or other proof that there are amyloid plaques, neurofibrillar tangles, and granulovacular or another form of degeneration in the brain. And so I would only limit the definition of Alzheimer's disease to that type of pathology. So. The major breakthrough in the understanding of Alzheimer's disease is not coming from clinical observation, et cetera, but it's really coming from the genetics. And so it might be quite interesting for you to realize that the risk to get Alzheimer's disease is estimated to be 60 to 80%. I think 80 is a bit exaggerated, but 60% is probably true, genetically determined. So it's in your genes, basically, despite what many people try to, to claim that it's environment. Uh, the evidence is that most of the risk is determined by your genetic makeup. And so this is in fact an overview uh, made by my colleague Hannah Holstegen uh, about what is known at this moment about genetic risk and Alzheimer's disease. And uh, uh, well, I will lead you through this, this table here. So here below you have the frequency of these alleles, these different genetic forms. So you have genetic mutations. Many of these here are single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with, with Alzheimer's disease or with dementia. And here you see the frequency of those mutations or, or SNPs in the population. So they go from very rare to very frequent. So 60, 70% of the people the population have that SNP, which influences your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And then here you see an, an estimation of how much risk of Alzheimer's it contributes to your overall risk. And so again, here at this site, you have very rare genes like crystalline one and APP, amyloid precursor protein, mutations of which are fully penetrant and give you 100% certainty that you will get Alzheimer's disease. At the other side, you have these many, many genes, and I will talk later in my talk about that, many genes which are linked to Alzheimer's disease and which basically linked via SNP single nucleotide polymorphisms in non-coding areas of the, of the, in the neighborhood of these genes. These genes are implied in Alzheimer's disease, but the risk that they bring with them is very small, few percent, few percent increase, or, 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 and there are even a couple of genes which give you protective um, uh, protection. And again, the most famous one is uh, a mutation in the amyloid precursor protein. Uh, called the Icelandic, which protects you, in fact, against Alzheimer's disease. And then, uh, uh, like APOE2 is another example uh, uh, of a gene which protects you against Alzheimer's disease. So as you can see, the genetic landscape is quite broad, quite interesting, and quite complicated, to be honest. But in any event, the question is now, we have the morphological definition of Alzheimer's disease, and we have here the genetic risk factors, so the first question is, how do these genetic risk factors and genetic risk correlate with the pathology of Alzheimer's disease? So this is really old story, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But so the first gene which was identified as a causal gene, one of these genes at the left side of the, the graphic, rare mutations, but very penetrant, are the mutations in the amyloid precursor protein. And so all these mutations are in this amyloid peptide sequence here, a small piece of this longer protein. And they all induce in one or another way, uh, we can discuss that if you have questions, but they all induce in one or another way, increased aggregation of a beta peptides. So 
So the second gene is the pristaline gene, and um, it's, there are many mutations in that gene. More than 180 mutations have been identified. All single amino acid substitutions, so no loss of functions, but, um, but uh, mutations. And so um, basically, pristaline is involved in the amyloid beta generation. So mutations in either amyloid precursor protein, the substrate, or mutations in the enzyme which cleaves the amyloid precursor protein, they cause Alzheimer's disease. And so we know even that the mutation, we don't know how these mutations in pristalin 1 affect amyloid precursor protein. So pristalin 1 this, this encodes the pristalin protein, this blue, uh, blue protein here, which is part of a larger complex, which is called the gamma secretase complex. And very interestingly, um, work from Sheres and, and Yigong Shi has shown that this pristalline subunit here, which is the catalytic domain, domain of the enzyme, is very flexible. It's like sitting in a cage, a cage formed by the three other proteins, and it has very, very flexible. And so what we found in the lab uh, work from um, Maria Saruga and uh, Lucia Chavez Gutierrez in my group, they found that if you increase the temperature uh, from 37 to 45 degrees uh, in your reaction mixture, and you form, you follow the production of amyloid precursor protein, a beta, so this amyloid peptide, you see an increase of the production of these long forms of amyloid beta. And so basically this tells you that this vibrating pristalline subunit is involved in the progressive cutting of the amyloid precursor protein, and that by increasing the temperature, but also by putting mutations in this pristalline subunit, you decrease the stability of the interaction, the substrate enzyme interaction of the pristalline subunit with the amyloid precursor protein. And the net result is that you get longer a beta peptides. So you can read the details in these publications if you want. But so that is, is really the core of the, of the disease comes from this interesting graphic. So what you see here is the age of onset of this different pristalline mutations. So patients, families in which these mutations are present have an age of onset, like with this mutation at age of onset around 25, and uh, patients with this mutation have an age of onset between 45 and 50. So this is really severe early dementia. Um, but you can see that every mutation has a different age of onset. And so by using this assay, which I just discussed with you, with you briefly, Maria Saruga and, and, um, and um, Lucia Chavez Gutierrez in my group were able to show that these mutations increase, uh, uh, increase from, from right to the left, increase the stability, destabilize, destabilize more the gamma secretase complex. So this mutation gives you the highest instability and these mutations has you, give you a less, uh, 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 um, more stability. And so you see that and this is correlated with the production of the a beta peptide. So the less stable your complex is, the more longer a beta peptide you generate because of the mechanism I discussed with you. So this really shows you that the production of this long a beta peptide is the initiator of the disease in these families. So we look here back to this uh, pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, as I mentioned to you in the introduction, plaques, tangles, neurodegeneration, I showed you evidence from rare mutations that all you need is a change in the production of this amyloid plaques. So the generation of this amyloid plaques to cause the full spectrum of Alzheimer's disease. So the, the tangles and the neurodegeneration. So the question then was, and has been, the field has been struggling for, for 20 years with that question. Despite the genetics, do amyloid plaques cause all these other lesions? That's in fact the question which we try to answer over the last years. And so the only way to do that is to make an animal model, basically make amyloid peptide aggregating in that animal model, and then seeing whether you get all the lesions, all the other lesions of Alzheimer's disease. And this has been, there are probably 150 different uh, mouse models made over the last uh, 20 years. And you can find the full list on ALS forum uh, recently, there is a bit of progress with uh, organoids and with uh, uh, iPSC cell cultures, and also with complex uh, uh, combination of uh, genes. 
But basically, none of the models which are available really mimics the food disease. And so you could say that in Mars, at least, it's not sufficient to have amyloid plaques and amyloid peptide to cause Alzheimer's disease. But so we were thinking that, that it's probably because we are working in the mouse and Alzheimer's disease is a human disease. So we thought we need to make better models. And so we thought, why don't we maintain the good things from the two sides? On the one hand, we use human cells. And on the other hand, we use the mouse brain as a container to receive these human cells and to grow them. And we use this mouse to expose these human cells to amyloid plaques because nobody has been able to generate amyloid plaques in vitro. So we have no way to test how amyloid plaques act on cells in an in vitro system. So we decided to reverse the problem and do it in vivo. So we take stem cells, we differentiate them to neuronal precursor cells, and then we graft these cells by an injection in neonate uh, mice at day three or four of birth, and then we leave them for forever. So of course, we have to immune suppress these mice. We use a RAC2 knockout, so the adapt adaptive immune system is uh, knocked out. But you will see that I still have a lot of, of immune responses. And we graft them in control mice, which have no amyloid plaques. And we graft them in this APP and LGF mouse, which produces um, amyloid plaques. And so this model we have published before, but this is a hugely improved model uh, versus the one we published in Neuron in 2017. So, and here you see, it's work from Sriam Balusu. Here you see neurons, these green neurons, these green grafts here are human neurons um, transplanted at day three after birth. And we analyze the mouse here at 18 months. And you see here really very nice neurons, as you can see here. And you can see here the, the dendritic spines, spines. So they have really, and uh, other people, a uh, collaborator of Mitjer van der Haaren, who, who, who started this type of work, has shown that these neurons also form uh, synaptic connections with mouse neurons and with other human neurons. So these are real neurons in a mouse brain. And you can see the mouse survived without much difficulties uh, for more than 18 months. And so these mice develop, and this is for the specialists, uh, the 3R and 4R repeats of tau. So the tau protein is the main part of the other lesion in Alzheimer's. So I told you that there are amyloid plaques and neuronal tangles. The tangles consist of abnormal accumulated tau. And so one of the things which is human specific is that the tau in human neurons express both a three repeat and a four repeat tau. It's an alternative splice form of tau. And you see here clearly here in this, here are all mouse neurons around, but you see here in this uh, green neurons and you see here that they are green so that they are human. You have three repeat and you have also four repeat. And here you see the four repeat only in the mouse neuron. So that's an important difference. And our model develops that at six months already. And so then uh, I told you this is a RAC2 knockout mouse. So that means that the, the adaptive immunity has been knocked out. And there's a lot of papers claiming that adaptive immunity is, is very important for Alzheimer's disease. And I think that I, I, I agree with that. But what we think is that it's not essential to get Alzheimer's disease. And I will show you uh, the evidence for that. So first of all, we tested whether in the RAC2, we had still formation of amyloid plaques. And you see here an amyloid plaque here, the blue staining is an amyloid plaque. And you see here measurements of amyloid peptide production. And you see that the levels are similar, both in the RAC uh, knockout and in the NLGF mouse, whatever we tested. So amyloid plaques are still formed. So the human neurons see amyloid plaques in this model. And then here you see that there is also a lot of inflammation because inflammation is important, but this is uh, not adaptive immunity, but, but innate immunity. And you see here astrogliosis in white, which you have a B staining. And you see here all these red, which are microglia, which got activated because they see these amyloid plaques. And so then, then one of the fantastic things is that these neurons, these human neurons, all of a sudden start to develop full Alzheimer's pathology. Here you see the human neurons in a control situation, so no amyloid plaques, quite normal, healthy neurons. And here you see the green staining for the human neurons. And you see also this blue staining, which are amyloid plaques. And you see all this red staining here, different forms, 
but all red. All these red are stainings for abnormally phosphorylated tau. So these are tangles, tangles which are accumulating in these neurons. And no other model has ever shown that it's enough to expose neurons to amyloid plaques to get the other lesion of Alzheimer's disease. And so you see here the quantification. It's very, very clear and very objective. And so when we did Sarkozyl extraction, so what you can do is you take the brain, and you can do that with humans, you take the brain and you do then an extract with Sarkozyl detergent, and then you pellet the, the non-Sarkozyl soluble pa, 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 pellet, and then in this pellet you will find tau fibers, so the, the aggregated, the tangles, the, the product, the, the, the tau protein, which has ag aggregated in neuronal tangles. And so we did that now in our mouse model. So we extracted basically the, the, the tau positive fraction from this um, from these uh, human neurons. And basically, this is the most important uh, figure here. This is electron microscopical uh, figure of a tau fibril, a sarcosyl insoluble tau fibril, stained with immunogold to prove that it is indeed tau. And so it's really quantitative. You can see that we get really a huge number of these fibrils in our extraction. So it's not, not something which we see uh, once in a while. And here you see a silver staining of the human neurons in this mouse context. And you see that they form this tangle-like structure. So you get really full Alzheimer pathology in this model. And so it goes even further because this is a living model. So uh, we can take some plot from these mice. And that's what we did here. And we measured this famous uh, plasma phosphotau 181 marker, which is one of the first biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease which you can measure in the blood of patients. And so we thought, well, we have these sick neurons in this mouse brain, so maybe we can measure this uh, biomarker also in the mouse. And that's what you see here. So we have here the control level, and here you see that in the amyloid transplanted mouse, you get a strong significant increase of phosphotau 181. So this is really a quite full model for Alzheimer's disease. So, but what about the neuronal cell death? Because that's also lacking in all the animal models which have been available. Um, so there is no real loss of neurons. And that's in fact, the signature of Alzheimer's disease. I told you, amyloid plaques, neuronal tangles, which I've shown you to, you to happen, and then neurodegeneration. So what we did is we measure here with the qPCR, the human DNA in the, in the mouse brain. So we take the mouse brain, we follow it after six months, we extract the, 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 the mouse brain, and we do then qPCRs to quantify the amount of human neurons present in the transplanted mouse. And so you can then compare the number of neurons in the control mouse and in the amyloid exposure mouse. And so you see that we lose about 50% of the human neurons after six months. So there is clearly no discussion here. There is neuronal cells. And so then, then we have, of course, a fantastic model here to study Alzheimer's disease, because now we are able to follow for the first time, because if you take a patient's brain, yeah, the neurons are dead, you don't know what happened before, but here we can really take neurons at different stages of the disease and look how they change over time. And so here we did an, uh, a gene expression analysis. And so here you have the graph at two months, and you see that the the, the, this is the difference between the control transplant in the control mouse and the transplant in the amyloid plaque forming mouse. At two months, there are no amyloid plaques in this mouse. They develop only starting from three months and they are fully present at six months. So there is no difference. This is good. That means that the human neurons transplant both in the control and in the Alzheimer model in a similar way. It's no difference. But then if you look at six months when there is abundantly plaques, you see a huge change in gene expression. And there are a couple of very, very interesting genes in these uh, alterations. Alpha-2 macroglobulin, which has been studied many years ago as, as being present in amyloid plaques. Um, there is this HBP, which has been linked to tau pathology. But there are two genes, which I'm going to talk a little bit more in the rest of, of my talk. There is here this MLKL, milk cult. And there is here this MEC3, maternal express gene tree. So you see, this one is interesting because it's very strongly, significantly upregulated in the neurons which are exposed to amyloid plaques. And this milk is very interesting for the reasons I'm going to explain to you. So here you see again this MAC3 and this milk. 
And so milk is in fact the executor of a cell death pathway. So you have apoptosis, you have theroptosis, and you have necroptosis. And so milk is in fact the final step which permeabilizes the membrane of cells which are going into necroptosis. And so we thought since milk is, op milk is upregulated here in our neurons, what happens with the necroptosis pathway? And the necroptosis pathway consists of an upregulation of phosphoripkinase 1, phosphoripkinase 2, and then phosphomelic, which permeabilizes the cells. And so as you can see here, we get very clearly this vesicular staining here with phosphoripkinase 1, so the kinase which activates the, the, the necroptosis pathway. And here you see also this red staining, not present in the control for phosphomelic, milk, which shows that the execution phase of the necroptosis pathway is present in these neurons. And we looked also for changes in other cell death pathways like apoptosis or phenoptosis, but we don't see any changes there. So it's a very specific activation of the necroptosis pathway in human neurons exposed to amyloid plaques. And so when we had that observation, we went to Dick Martal, who is a neuropathologist working in Leuven, quite famous uh, neuropathologist. And we asked him, has there ever been evidence for necroptosis in neurons of Alzheimer's disease? Actually, do we know how human neurons die in Alzheimer's disease? And so he said that there was not much evidence. There was some discussion about apoptosis, but that has never been proven. And so he said, yeah, I'm interested to look in human patients to see whether necroptosis is present there. And so we have published that already in the meantime. So he stained for phosphoripkinase 1, phosphoripkinase 3, and phosphomelk. And here you see the pictures. I think they are very, very convincing. You see here these vesicular stainings of these vesicles in human neurons. And so the funny thing is that Diet Martal and many other neuropathologists are looking to these vesicles already for decades and they call it granovacular neurodegeneration. And so here we found that this granovacular neurodegeneration is in fact signs of necroptosis going on in Alzheimer's brain. So we thought this is very exciting. So basically we know now that neurons in Alzheimer's disease die from necroptosis. And I will show you some additional exciting um, data in a minute, but I just want to talk two minutes about this other gene, which was up in our human neurons when they saw amyloid plaques. And that's this MEC3, so maternal expressed gene 3. So MEC3 is a non-coding RNA, and it's upregulated tenfold in our transplanted neurons. So we wanted to know what it's doing. So the first thing that we did was look in Alzheimer's disease cases, and we did a qPCR to quantify a MEC3. And you see that we get a quite significant uh, upregulation of MEC3 in Alzheimer's brain. And here it's even nicer because we used RNA scope, so we did an in situ hybridization. And you see here this nuclear staining of MEC3, so it's something which is in nuclei, and it's only in, in neuronal nuclei. So we have also co stainings with astrocytes and microglia and others, but it's only present in the human neurons. And here you see clearly that in Alzheimer's disease, this MEC3 becomes strongly overexpressed, and this is a quantification of it. So what we saw in our model and predicted in our model that MEC3 would be an upregulated gene in Alzheimer's disease basically is confirmed. So that's the second prediction we made with our model that is confirmed in patients. So the first was that neurons in Alzheimer's disease would die from necroptosis, which was not known before, and it's right. And this here, MEC3 is strongly upregulated in uh, our neurons, so it should be upregulated in Alzheimer's disease. But then we started to take a little bit further because MEC3 has been involved in cancer research in cell death control. And so we thought maybe this MEC3 is upregulated and regulates the necroptosis in the neurons as we see them. And so we first checked uh, because there are 10 different transcripts of MEC3. So we found out that variant one is the most highly expressed in, in brain. We cloned that transcript in a lentiviral vector. We made human-derived stem cell from stem cells, human-derived neurons, and we transduced them with MEC3, the, the lentiviral, to overexpress it. And one of the first things we, say, we saw, really surprisingly, was that the neurons which expressed MEC3 were dying over time, as you can see here, while the control transduced neurons remained stable. So this was already good evidence to think that this MEC3 is really involved in the killing of the neurons. 
And so then the question was, is this indeed inducing necroptosis now in this culture or what is, what is happening here? So we extracted these neurons. We did uh, Western blot. And you see here, phosphoric kinase one. If you remember, that's the kinase which initiates the uh, cell death pathway. And you see here in this first differentiation and in this independent second differentiation, not, that, not in the neurons which are transduced with control, but in the neurons transduced with MEC3, that we get induction, very clear the induction of this phosphoric kinase one. So indeed, MEC3 induces necroptosis in human neurons. And so here we see some stainings. I'm not going to, to, to dwell too long on it. Of course, these neurons look not very healthy because they are dying, but you see here stainings, phosphoric kinase one, phosphoric kinase three, and you see here also the phosphomelic, the executor which kills these neurons. So no doubt that, um, that MEC3 is involved in the necroptosis in these human neurons and likely also in, uh, in patients. And so then the next step is of course, what would happen if you would block necroptosis? That's something you cannot do in the human being, not yet, but you can do it in this mouse model. And so we have given this mouse model, this, uh, well, this human, human model, basically, um, uh, inhibitors of necroptosis. So there are a couple of com commercial ones, potanipip and tabrafenip, both are uh, inhibitors of the kinases, the, the either rapkinase, rapkinase 1 or rapkinase 3. And so, as you can see here, we have a lot of milk staining in the non the control treated mouse, but you see that this is disappearing in the treated mouse with two different inhibitors. And I think here you have some quantification, but this is the most important one. You see that we can reconstitute the, or we can stabilize the neurons when we treat the pondatinib or tafrafenib. So this really shows you because you have to think about it. If you um, show these necroptosis markers, that's always the neurons which are still present. You don't know whether neurons which disappeared, disappeared from something else or disappeared because of necroptosis. So this basically shows you that indeed the neuronal cells you see is driven by necroptosis. So I think this closes the circle and this opens of course also the idea that you might treat patients with these necroptosis inhibitors. But that's of course still a long run before we are there. So I think this is this this model, and I, I'm well as you hear, I'm quite excited about it. Is for me really an important step in in the field because it basically closes the circle. So so we simply didn't know what happens beyond amyloid plaque and amyloid pathology generation. There's a lot of indirect evidence that it's an important step in the pathology, but this. Here shows you for the first time that the exposure of human neurons is sufficient to get the full cascade of Alzheimer's disease. And so this is an excellent neuropathological model for Alzheimer's disease. So there remain, of course, a lot of questions. And so how is this amyloid now affecting these neurons? Um, is this necroptosis downstream or parallel to the tau pathology? Important question. Is it enough to block necroptosis to restore cognition or to maintain cognition? So are these neurons, once they go into necroptosis and you block the necroptosis, they remain there, but are they still functional? The big question here, and I didn't stress it, but I will do that in the next part of my talk. What is the role of other cell types? I showed you a lot of microgliosis and astrogliosis around these neurons. Are they contributing to the cell death or not? And then the main big question, and we can discuss that afterwards if you want, is why do the transplanted human neurons develop the full pathology and the mouse neurons, which are just next sitting to it, remain healthy? What's the specific factor here which makes this difference? So what I explained to you until now is that causal mutations increase the amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease. Amyloid plaques, or amyloid pathology, we need to be a little bit careful because it's not only plaques, cause tangle formation and necroptosis. So then why, why for the hell are all these amyloid therapies which have been tested over the last 10, 15 years, why have they not more spectacular results in Alzheimer's disease? And so I can, I can give a whole seminar about that, about all the mistakes which have been made uh, when these drugs were tested. Um, and the uh, wrong assumptions, but I have no time and I want to, ha to have a basic research seminar here. But I think one of the reasons 
So on the one hand, I think that drug development can improve a lot in this field, and we really need much more effort there. But on the other hand, the field needed also to recheck its favorite hypothesis, the amyloid cascade hypothesis. And so that's something which I started to do in 2016. So is it sufficient to have amyloid? Is it sufficient to have amyloid plaques to get the whole cascade of Alzheimer's disease? And so basically we knew already that that's not the case because if you put amyloid plaques or amyloid pathology in a mouse, you don't get Alzheimer's disease. So that tells you basically that it's not sufficient. And so we started to think on the other hand, because of the genetics, which I, I've explained to you, it's very clear that it's a problem. So we started to think together with Eric Aram, more like a beta amyloid peptide is not, not the driver of the disease, it's a trigger. It's something which needs to be there, but then there need to be other things which then evolve and make the disease. And one of the arguments to think that it's a long process is that the accumulation of amyloid peptides in patients happens 15 to 30 years before you get this end stage of dementia. So there is no simple direct relationship between the accumulation of a beta and this catastrophe at the end of the disease. There must be a lot of things happening in between. And that we call the cellular phase. And basically I show you here this picture from Alvis Alzheimer, because basically this guy was very clever. He had also drawn not only the amyloid plaques, but also all the abnormal cells around these amyloid plaques. And so what we think now, and that's really um, uh, why I put this stamp here, that this phase is the most important part of Alzheimer's disease. And we need to understand that, how the cells protect your brain against, against amyloid. Because that's the real thing what happens here. During these 20 years, the brain is in resilience is fighting against this amyloid accumulation and remains in a homeostatic mechanism. And so we need to understand that. And so our first approach there to the cellular phase was to use new technology, this spatial transcriptomics and in situ sequencing. And you might have heard about it. It's really a spectacular technology. I will briefly explain to you. So yeah, we published the paper in Cell. You can look at the details there. Um, my slides got stuck a bit. Yeah, okay. So here you have a mouse, and you see here in yellow this uh, amyloid plaques accumulating in the cortical areas and then later in the hippocampal areas. And you see that it accumulates at 3, 6, 12, 18 months. So there is a progressive amyloid accumulation. And that's the model which we are using for our transplantation. And that's also the model which is, or one of the models which is used generally in the field. So we are mostly interested in these amyloid plaques in general. But if you look in the microscope, you see that these amyloid plaques not only are sitting there innocently and, 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 and doing nothing, the effects in the mouse are small on the neurons, but look here to this astroglia. They accumulate and you could do the same with microglia. So these amyloid plaques are not sitting there innocently. These mouse brains and the human brains are doing a lot around these amyloid plaques. So we were interested what happens there, in fact, because you can do that morphologically, but molecularly, how do you analyze that? Well, that's where the spatial transcriptomics came in. And so to put it briefly, you cut the brain, you get this slice, you put it on this uh, spatial transcriptomic array, which is basically a cover slip with small dots on, and I will explain you these dots in a minute. And we take two slices next to that middle slice where we do all the morphology on. And so we can align afterwards the morphological information with the RNA transcription information, which we get from this slide. So what is this slide? So here you see a magnification. So these are all these yellow dots and you see this half brain on top of it. And so each dot here contains oligo DTs. So they, each, each dot is capable to capture the mRNA from the cells above it. So we permeabilize this tissue here and this mRNA is binding to these oligo DTs. And then we can release from every spot this uh, mRNA. And because we have built in an ID barcode for every spot, we can then sequence this and we can then use this ID to bring back the mRNA to these different spots. And so, yeah. And so, well, I, I don't have the picture here. I forgot to bring that, but well, yeah, you can see it here. 
basically, such a spot covers a micro domain. So with about hundreds of cells, but you can have really a domain, you can really measure all the activity in the cells close to the amyloid plaque, or if you have a, 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 such a an, such an, um, tissue domain, we call it, far away from a plaque, then you know what happens in the tissue domains where there are no amyloid plaques. So we did that, and I'm going to, to summarize, you can, you can look at it in, in the paper, uh, but here you see all these micro domains. Uh, so you see all the, the genes, gene expression we saw at three months, um, at three months old, and here in the axis you see how much exposure to plaques, and here you see whether it's uh, Alzheimer's disease or not. And so I'm, I'm, I, I really need to, to make this simplistic because otherwise I, I need uh, half an hour to explain you these graphs. But what you see here in red are genes which are involved in oligodendrocyte function. And you see that they go up at three months of age and they go down at six months of age. So it's a whole cluster of oligodendrocyte genes and we call that the oligomodule of genes. And then you see here all these purple genes and they are very interesting because they are not changed at three months, but look at this, they become extremely upregulated at 18 months and we call that plaque induced genes. And so it's very cool because these genes, when we do gene ontology, are involved in complement activation, endocytosis, lysosomal degradation, oxidative stress, immune response, antigen processing, and presentation. And because they are in this part of the graph, we know that these genes are upregulated in the neighborhood of the amyloid plaques, but not away from the amyloid plaques. So this is a this is a gene response induced by amyloid plaques. And so then we can do this very nice bioinformatic analysis. So here you have the list of all these genes. So we know that these genes are expressed in astroglia and that these genes, this one. So in astroglia and these genes are expressed in microglia and these genes are not very strongly expressed in steady state conditions, but get upregulated when they are exposed, when the cells are exposed to plaques. And so what you see is that these genes here are co-regulated in the astrocytes. If the link is a co-regulation, strength of co-regulation. And these genes are co-regulated in the microglia, but you see that there is not much crosstalk between these two genes, these groups in a tissue domain where there is no amyloid plaque, as you can see here. So then we go to a tissue domain where there is a level two of amyloid plaques, like this one. And you see here how this network is building up. So there is not only stronger interaction here between these genes, but also with these genes get upregulated and incorporated in this regulatory gene network. So we go further, that's level four. You see here very strong interactions and then level six. And then at level eight, where there's a lot of uh, amyloid plaques, you see very strong crosstalk between microglia and astroglia. And for instance, APOE, which is known to be very important for Alzheimer's disease, is part of that. Um, there are a couple of other interesting genes like TIROP and TREM2, uh, these complement genes, etc. So this is a very crucial network in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. And so I, I talked already about this uh, gene ontology. So we call this network here plaque-induced genes, a multicellular network which induces the activation of classical complement cascade and, and these other lysosomes, dysfunction, antigen processing, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we are, of course, working very hard to see whether there are drug targets in this network, et cetera. So the last 10 minutes of my talk, I would like to broaden out this scope towards the other genes in Alzheimer's disease. So what I talked about was that causal mutations increase amyloid plaques. Amyloid plaques cause tangle formation and necroptosis, and this, this neuronal model, and finally, I showed you that this amyloid pathology doesn't induce immediately all this pathology, but that it acts via a slow cellular process, which involves microglia and astroglia. But so what about these other genes? We have a very good explanation for what amyloid precursor protein and prisiline genes mutations are doing, but all these 60 other genes, what are they doing? So here you see this table again. So I talked mainly about these genes here and how they then induce a cascade. And so you have all these other genes like APOE, TREM2, um, SORL1, et cetera, et cetera. All these other genes which affect your genetic risk of Alzheimer's disease. What are these genes doing? 
And does it make sense to think about these genes in the context of the cellular phase of Alzheimer's disease, which we just discussed? So a first, a first concept that I would like to clarify here is that we need to think differently than in the old age when we were studying Alzheimer's disease. So when in the beginning of Alzheimer's disease, we all thought we have a gene mutation, it's causal in amyloid precursor or in person in one, we transduce that gene, this mutation, and this mutation is causative, so we will get Alzheimer's disease. And that's right for causal genes. But for risk genes, which increase your risk for 5%, 10%, 30%, it cannot be that simple that just expressing that risk gene will give you Alzheimer's disease. It says that your chance to get Alzheimer's disease increases. And so I think the thing is more like, like, uh, like when you think about risk in, in, in car accident. So if you fasten your seatbelt, you decrease your risk in a car accident to get wounded or dead. But as long as you are driving and you don't get any car accidents, you will never know why this belt is important. And so I think that these risk genes can only be understood if you study them in the context of something which drives Alzheimer's disease. And so that's why I stay always very close to the plaques and the tangles because that's surely Alzheimer's disease. But so there are no, no good models apart from our transplantation model. But so when we did these experiments, we had that model not yet. So we thought, let's take amyloid plaque mouse and let's take mouse which form these neuronal tangles and let's see how the risk genes which contribute to Alzheimer's disease, how they change their expression against amyloid plaques and against neuronal tangles. And again, this is a very, very complicated study, but I will just give you the highlight. So we analyzed all the gene changes in a mouse which has amyloid plaques and we changed, analyzed all the gene changes in the tau mouse, we thought that there would have been a lot of overlap, but that's not true. So you can see that here in this graph, and don't, don't worry, I will explain to you. So this, in these directions, all the genes we changed in the tau mouse are indicated. And in this direction, all the genes changing in the APP mouse are indicated. And so genes we change similar in the tau and in the, in the amyloid mouse, they would be on this axis, but there are very little genes like that. But what you see here and what you see here are genes which are changing uh, according to the tau axis. It's not so important to all, but mainly genes involved in neuronal biology. But here you see this huge cloud of significantly changed upregulated genes in the amyloid model. And this cloud of genes contains a lot of inflammatory genes. And on top of that, many genes indicated by the, uh, by the genetics as risk genes of Alzheimer's disease. And so I'm just going, well, I'm going to skip this one. So basically what we published as a consequence of this study is that major risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, I mean, all these different genes, but also age. And again, you can read that paper and sex, so male or female, affect the microglia response to amyloid plaques. So this risk, is largely determining how the microbiome and your brain react on amyloid plaques. So, and that makes a lot of sense, as you will see. But then you come with the limitations again of the animal model. As I said to you, we can make amyloid plaques. We get neuroinflammation there, but we don't, don't get our neurons die. So is there something different between the neuroinflammatory response in the mouse and the neuroinflammatory or microbial response in human? And here you see all the genes which are changed or which you can, all the risk genes of Alzheimer's disease, which we have found to be expressed in mouse neurons. And here you see all the risk genes for Alzheimer's disease, which we can identify in human neurons. So there's clearly a major difference between mouse and human neurons. And so Renzo Macuso, who is now an independent group leader, developed in my group a fantastic elegant solution based on the neuronal transplantation model, which I discussed already with you. So, but now instead of transplanting human neurons, we took out the mouse neurons by treating them with, uh, with a certain toxin. And then we transplant again after birth, iPSC derived microglia. And I'm not going to go into the details. You can read the protocol elsewhere, but here just this picture tells you all. So what you see here is a slice through a, human, uh, through, through a mouse brain and every green dot here is a human microglia. So we got really 60 to 80% of the mouse microglia 
replaced by human microglia. So this is a fantastic model to study what happens in human microglia during Alzheimer's disease. And so I'm going to show you, and this is the last three or four minutes, a kind of complicated experiment again, but I will explain it in a very simple way. This is a single cell analysis. And so what we do is we transplant this mouse microglia into, uh, this human microglia into the mouse brain. We expose this human microglia to amyloid plaques. We extract them after six months out of this mouse brain again. We only analyze the human microglia. We do a single cell analysis. That means that we determine the transcriptome of every cell separately. We can do, do that nowadays with 10x technology. And so what you see, and then we can use this bioinformatics, which is uh, here on um, a kind of UMAP or, or other, it's a two-dimensional reduction of all the data. So every spot you see here is reflecting the transcriptome of one of the microglia that we isolate. So it's a bit daunting, but that's nowadays what can be done with this type of technologies. So for every microglia here, we have about 2000, 2000 different transcripts and the levels of these transcripts. And the computer analyzes this, this, this transcripts and sorts the microglia in groups, in related groups. So all the microglia with a similar expression profile are clustered, for instance, in this HM cluster, which is the homeostatic cluster, or in this purple cluster, which is the amyloid response. But nowadays we change that name. It's basically, we, we agree that it's the DAM response, which has been published by others, the, the, the damage associated microglia, which is typically seen in amyloid plaque uh, mouse. Uh, transition uh, um, and, and here cytokine response microglia, interferon response microglia, etc. And so, this is the end result. There is about 200,000 uh, microglia in this, so from, from many, many different experiments. And so then you can start to look where are these microglia coming from? So we know from every microglia from which mouse it's coming. So these are all the microglia coming from the wild type mouse. So there are no amyloid plaques. And you see here a density distribution. You see that a large part of this uh, microglia is in a homeostatic state. So in the wild type situation, the microglia are in rest. And then you see here in the amyloid mouse that a lot of this homeostatic shift towards the CRM, the cytokine response, towards this, here it's negative. So you see here, most of these cells here are, driven, are derived from microglia in the amyloid plaque. So these are the DAM response. And you see that it's, it go to an HLA response and an IRM response. And you see these three components, and I have, these three components are reflecting the response of human microglia on amyloid plaques because it's much lower here in the control situation. And so you can follow this in trajectories, but I'm not going to, to, to make it too, 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 hard, uh, too hard. But what we have shown basically is that these responses here are dependent on the presence of amyloid plaques. So this is the microglia response to amyloid plaques. And this response is the response to amyloid oligomers, so the cytokine response. So we get a really complex cellular response of microglia to amyloid pathology. And so when we knock out TREM2, for instance, which is one of these major genes involved in Alzheimer's disease uh, and regulating microglia function, what you can see here is that um, the, in the knockout here, so the TREM2 knockout, that this intermediary response here, this DAM response, here, uh, here the arm response, but it's the, it should be dumb response, has been strongly lowered. And this HLA response is also strongly lowered. Why the cytokine response against the plaques is maintained. So that's also something in the, you read about the TREM2, which is a uh, receptor of microglia. If you knock it out, it knocks out this amyloid plaque response, but it still keeps or even activates a cytokine response uh, of the microglia. So I want to wrap up here. I think time, time is used. Um, um, I think that there is a couple of, of big uh, conclusions here. First of all, we are far beyond the classical amyloid plaque theory for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we are now getting really in the full cascade and we know now that it's a multicellular response, which is not only translating in neuronal dysfunction and neuronal cell death, uh, necroptosis, but which is, uh, is earlier reflected in the microglia response 
which has three different responses, which can be protective and which can be damaging. And that's, some, that's one of the main questions there. So, so just to read you out, amyloid peptide and amyloid plaques are important in Alzheimer's disease, but they are triggering a series of cellular reactions that might or might not lead to dementia. And that's something which I didn't stress enough, but it's basically the cellular response which decides whether you go into dementia or not. So it can perfectly become 100 years with amyloid plaques in your brain if your genes are protected. If your genes take care that your microglia and your astroglia react in a protective way. If your genes, if you have an overload, polygenic risk of many risk genes, and you get a little bit of amyloid plaques, you will get very quickly Alzheimer's disease. So it is in your genes, and it's the way your, your cells cope with amyloid plaques that determine whether you get Alzheimer's disease or not. And a second important conclusion is that microglia are central players in the transduction of this amyloid pathology. The effects are complex. They are much more complex in human microglia than in mouse microglia. And the big question now, and that's a big challenge for the field at this moment, what part of this microglia response is protective? Is the IRM response protective? And what is damaging? And so that's what we need to investigate. And so at the end, I want to thank the many investigators involved in this. I mentioned a few of them, Siriam especially for the neuronal uh, model, I think Ashley, Mark for the uh, spatial transcriptomic, and Nikki, Nico, Anna, Renzo um, for the microglia team and all the microglia work, Carlo. Uh, Catherine, Amerike, and Kathleen for all the preparatory work, the initial work for the transcriptomics, et cetera, et cetera. And so here, a uh, final, uh, final slide to make some publicity for the UK Dementia Research Institute. We are now in our fifth year. Uh, it's a fantastic institute in different centers here over the country, working very well together. And we have a fantastic publication uh, output at the moment already and several collaborations with industry. We got our first spin-off an $80 million uh, company, which is testing gene therapy for uh, ALS. Uh, so it's going very well. And then here, if you have some time, you can read what Margaret Chan said in, 2000, uh, in 2017 or 2016 about Alzheimer's disease. There is nothing more important than study dementia. Dementia is not just a public health priority. It is a public policy priority. When the private sector does not want to invest in R&D, we need to look at why and when market fails, we require strong leadership. And that's what the UK DRI wants to do. You are stepping in to take the slack and making sure people affected by such devastating disease can have the hope that they need. And I think that's really the message I want to bring to you. And that's why we do basic research in this area. So thank you very much. And um, if there are questions, I'm happy to try to address them. Bart, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased with your talk. And I'm also pleased because we have here many students. And I would like to stress to them that here today you presented very important results regarding the Alzheimer's disease, uh, regarding Alzheimer's disease. And also to emphasize to them that you presented novel technological scientific techniques, like the novel approach to generate brain diseases, brain disease models, and also a novel approach to analyze spatial expression of genes in the brain. So the BART is available for questions. Uh, if there are any questions, please either um, write them in the chat or speak. I would like to ask a question until some people are preparing probably. I want to ask whether part you believe that plaques can cause Alzheimer's disease through microglial cells. Yeah, that's the hypothesis, but uh, that was really the hypothesis while we did all this work, but at the moment I'm, I'm not so sure anymore. <laughs> um, it's probably a bit compli more complicated. So the microglia have certainly an effect on amyloid plaque formation. So that could be the way that they influence it. Uh, they have also, um, they also interact with the astroglia, and I think that it's basically interplay between these two cells. Um, I, to make it brief, I still think that the amyloid plaques affect the microglia and that the microglia affect the neurons. That's my simple view. But, but we have already done some depletion experiments with microglia, and, 
and there is still some pathology going on. So it's probably a bit more complicated than simple saying the microglia are the, the guilty ones. But your data are really impressive. But I wanted to ask you, how can you explain the fact that the, in Alzheimer's disease brain, we have a di differential distribution of plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Plaques appear in the cortex, while um, 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 neurofibrillary tangles appear in the basal brain and torrinal cortex first and the hippocampus. Yeah. Do you but have an explanation for that? Well, I don't have a good explanation. Uh, um, it's one of the questions and was for me also surprised to see how clearly amyloid plaque induces uh, neuronal tangles in neurons. I still think that it's a possibility even with that model. Um, so I think that the tau pathology, like, uh, like before it, it, it leaves the entorenal cortex. So the, the tau pathology you see in the brain stem and, and, and to a certain extent, uh, up to the entorenal cortex is very associated with aging. And so that's basically also, if you read the papers from Brack, he says that 100% of the people have that type of pathology. And there is also a couple of papers which say that this is part, normal, normal part of, uh, of aging. So I think that there's a natural tendency for tau to aggregate and form these tangle-like structures. But it's only when you have amyloid plaques that you see that also the rest of the brain gets penetrated with these tangle structures. And so we know from mouse models, and we know it also from our own work, that if you have amyloid plaque and you inject tau, that this tau gets fastly propagated over the brain. But the big question is that nobody knows how that happens actually. So some people think that it's really the tau which goes over the axons and is then deposited elsewhere. But it could be as well that the amyloid induces your tau and tangles and spreads in that way the tau pathology over the brain. And so what I think is that, that, um, that, that, there is, that the main driver of this uh, spreading of tau, it's only when amyloid plaques and tau are in the same areas of the brain that you have full Alzheimer's disease virus. So there is initially this discrepancy, but it's only uh, then that dementia occurs. That's basically what I want to say. And I think that amyloid is driving the induction of tangles in these areas where you normally never find tangles. So simplistic explanation, but that's what I think. Uh, we have a comment from Skulakis. He says that he thanks very much for the great talk. And he comes to this question that you probably have answered it already. And he says, given that pathological tau spreads, what is its relationship to plaques? I mean. Well, that's what I try to explain. I mean, the spreading is, a, is, 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 is one thing, but we basically show here, but well, I, I need to show, I, I should have shown you an additional experiment that we did. So what we also did was to inject in our mouse model uh, around nine months, uh, seeds, tau seeds from an, um, from an Alzheimer patient, which is known to spread, uh, to spread uh, which, which, which is uh, known, this is known to, to spread in certain models, tau pathology. So that's the, the we, we got them from Virginia Lee, this material, so it's, it's really well characterized and, and acknowledged. So if we inject that tau in our mouse model, the control mouse model, with human neurons, we inject it, we don't find any tau back. It disappears, there is no harm, there is nothing happening. If we inject that in our mouse model with the amyloid plaques, we see an enormous acceleration of the tau pathology through the brain, through all the neurons. So that tells me that tau spreading and tau seeding is critically dependent on the presence of amyloid plaques or amyloid pathology. And so I think that's basically consensus. So, and you can now explain that in two ways, and maybe the two are true. You know that these amyloid plaques induce, um, induce hyperactivity of the neurons. And we know that some tau is secreted uh, when you have hyperactivity of neurons. So it could be that the amyloid plaques induces spreading of the tau pathology, but our data show 
that the amyloid pathology is also able to induce abnormally phosphorylated tau and tanga like structures. So the spreading could be two, could be the two pathways. So basically, the amyloid plaques induce in many, many neurons around them a tendency to form tangles and tau. And then the seed on top of it accelerate that whole process. And that's the way I'm thinking about it at this moment. Peter? Yes, uh, there is another um, oh, okay. comment from a student. Mm -hmm. She asks, what would be your advice to students that want to work on AD research? Do it. Do it. <laughs> Do it. This is the, the, the most important, uh, important disease. Well, I mean, dementia in general, but, but it's, it's like cancer 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, this is the most abundant problem, medical problem for, our, for in the world. So in UK, for instance, there are more people now dying with dementia as a diagnosis than of any other cause. So it's more important than COVID in, in, in that number of deaths and, and than cancer. And so, um, so, I mean, the need is enormous and it's a huge market to be put it in another way because it has been underfund, underfunded for decades. So there are about five times more people in the cancer research than in the neurodegeneration research. So if you are a young scientist and you want to be in a field where there is still a lot of things possible and the competition is not cutting your throat, that's the field to go in. And the third reason to do it as a scientist is, um, is that there is nothing more interesting than to study the brain and to, to learn about how a brain works and what the brain is doing. It's the last big frontier in biology. So anybody who wants to study this, I would strongly advise to do that. And then the other point is, what should you study in this area? Well, I mean, it's your own gut feeling. I mean, everything needs to be studied. We need still a lot of basic research. And that's what I mainly showed you today. Um, and we need basic research in many different ways. I didn't show you anything about electrophysiology and connections between neurons. I find that one of the most fascinating areas of neuroscience, and that's what is destroyed in the end by the disease. So if you want to study that, fantastic. If you want to go into the genetics, I wouldn't do pure genetics of Alzheimer's disease anymore, but trying to understand how different genes increase your profile and how genes interact with the environment, super interesting. Modeling, I showed you one next step. I mean, the next step is organoids. How can we make entirely human models for this disease? If you want to make drugs, I think that the companies will expand and, 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 and are looking for people who do medicine, chemistry, et cetera. Data science. I, I can go on. It's it's really plenty. Uh, I would like, uh, Spiro, thank you uh, to thank also uh, Dr. Desrup for this amazing uh, talk. And uh, I have a question, a fast question, a uh, quick question about the uh, drug screenings and therapeutic potentials of this amazing uh, new um, mouse human mouse models. We know until now that a lot of drugs, uh, they failed. Uh, they, they were successful in uh, mice, uh, but uh, failed in humans. So what do you think now? Can we go back and uh, use these uh, human mouse models to test uh, yes. these uh, drugs? I'm happy that you bring that up because I, come, I become every time very nervous. So the big companies, they had a lot of failures. And then they say, oh, these basic scientists, they are just bad scientists. They treat mice and they don't treat the disease. I think this is really, really such a bad criticism. I mean, gamma secretase was found in mouse work and everything which has been published on gamma secretase or almost everything which has been predicted on gamma secretase has been translated in humans. So the side, inclusive the side effects. So, I mean, all this bullshit about, about that, that we are curing mouse, etc. A mouse is a model and you use the model to test a certain hypothesis. So if you say this drug is going to modify, um, let's say tau, you test it in the mouse and you show that it modifies tau. And then in your clinical trial, you, you need to test first that it modifies tau like it did in the mouse. That's the first question. And the second question is, what is your therapeutic hypothesis? How do you think that that will influence the human disease? because we know that the mouse is not reflecting the human disease. So you cannot say I cure a mouse. No, you can say I treat a specific molecular mechanism in the mouse and I've shown that it works. And so 
all the companies failed mostly in their trials by showing that the mechanism, which was checked in a mouse, was checked in the right way in the human, human patient. I will just ridiculize it a little bit, but the first uh, trials with antibodies, they were testing, the, testing whether an antibody could remove amyloid plaques from the brain. They stopped the trials. They had no proof that amyloid plaque was removed from the brain, but they stopped the trial. They stopped the trial among others because it turned out that 30% of the people they thought had dementia, of Alzheimer's disease, had dementia, but had no plaques in their, in their brain. So these were people which were treated with a drug which never could work. And then they say, this data don't translate from mouse to human. I mean, that's bullshitting. So, so that's one part of my answer. The other answer is much more positive. I think that this is indeed, that this model is much more close to what happens in humans. And so you cannot really test if I treat the amyloid with one or another drug, do I affect the necroptosis? Do I affect the tau pathology, et cetera? And then again, this is only, only a proof of concept, only a model is the responsibility of the clinical trialist to think about in which patient is this pathway really important. It's like in the cancer field there, they are 20 years in front of us. They never put a cancer drug in all people with cancer or in all people with a blood cancer. They very carefully define the subgroup in which the mechanism they are targeting is very important. They do a proof of concept there. If it works, then they start to think in what other patients can I try it where that mechanism contributes to the disease. And so, I think this model basically allows you to, to, to test more different mechanisms than the mechanism we could test before. So, so in a nutshell, that's in fact the answer to your question. But I profited a bit, so about, a bit to talk about the frustration of a, an academic <laughs> scientist uh, when he hears all this, this slogan-esque criticism, um, yeah. uh, which I don't agree with. I think we did fantastic work in the Alzheimer's field. Uh, when I entered, was, I have about the same age as Spiros, when we entered, the genes were not known. Um, we had no clue. It was all neuropathology that we had. So, I mean, it's an amazing story. And then with 10 times less money than the cancer field, I think we did what we could. Thank you so much. Thank you. Your, yeah, I think your, uh, your question has been largely answered. So I'll, I'll ask Yanis Zaganas to, to place his question. So thank you for this uh, fantastic talk. It's, it's very... Uh, eye-opening on many mechanisms. So do you think there's an overarching theme for, uh, let's say, prion-like uh, propagation of uh, abnormal proteins like uh, um, tau or uh, even TDP43, uh, for which you, you made uh, uh, a comment, but uh, do you think it has also an important role to play in Alzheimer's disease uh, pathogenesis? Yeah, it's a very good question. So. So I'm a bit skeptical. I, I find it a fascinating observation, and and um, and I think it it, it it is there. There is no doubt uh, that there is some spreading mechanism there, um, which was. Uh, but I will say three things. First of all, um, the prion knows that already for thirty years or forty years, and they have never solved it. They have never been able to show that this is the the disease mechanism, blah, 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 et cetera. They have no mechanism. So, so that's for me a problem. And it's very easy to have a fascinating observation, but it's much less easy to find a mechanism and to, to, to show the relevance of that observation. And I'm missing that to a certain extent. So you get these fantastic papers on spreading of these pathologies, but then what's, what does it mean? What, 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 does it, what is the cause and what is the consequence, basically? That's one. Second, um, I've tried to explain with my model that, that, that the two things are important, that you have the seeding and the spreading, and that the seeding, we demonstrate seeding of the pathology by amyloid plaques very clearly. We have some indication of spreading, but when we inject this, this, this tau seeds into the mouse, what we see is also a super activation of inflammatory parameters. And so I'm not sure whether it's just the spreading of these tau seeds, which disappear entirely in the wild type model. Eh? So is it the spreading of the seeds which you injected, or is it really just an acceleration of inflammatory pathways 
which accelerate the disease of the whole brain. So in a nutshell, a fascinating domain, we need to understand it better, but we cannot say at this moment that that explains the neurodegeneration. Another question by Nick Grigoriadis is that, could the distribution of plaques may be related to the diversity of microglia subtype distribution throughout the brain parenchyma, particularly if we consider microglia a major key player in AD pathology? It's a very good question. So all models are limited. And so I present, of course, my model as, as, as fantastic. Uh, uh, if I would have two hours more, I would give you all the, the, the problems and the, the, the negative side. One of the negative sides is one that you have a human cell in a mouse background. While you would like to have a human cell in a human background, there are receptor ligand interactions uh, which don't work like CSF1, uh, just to, to, to tell you one. Um, so that's one limitation. The second limitation is that we do not take into account this spatial special um, heterogeneity. Um, maybe we can do that in the future, but at the moment, our resources and the way we make these models do not allow us to, to really go into that detail. So I agree with you. So this is a fascinating question. There are other groups working on that, um, but I think that, that at this moment, these studies are limited to mouse because you want to have the mouse cells sitting in the... and uh, you, because then, then you can really study the, the cells in their, in their original place. And you need to, we need to acknowledge that most of these microglia, well, that the microglia in, in, in development are generated, um, are generated before birth and that there is not much contribution afterwards from peripheral monocytes or whatever to that population. So it's a very specific population. And so we transplant basically a microglia back into the mouse brain, which is not co-evolving uh, during embryogenesis, etc. So, so I think there are a couple of limitations to what we can do. So I only look to the positive data, but there are certainly things which we will miss with this model. Bart, uh, do environmental factors contribute possibly via epigenetic mechanism to Alzheimer's disease pathology? What is your opinion? Yes. Yes, but I think that uh, there is now a an, 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 an fashion to over, over stress this. So first of all, I think that epigenetics uh, changes aging. Aging is for me the, the, major, the major elephant in the, in the room here. Um, and aging changes your epigenetics. And so there was this nice paper from, um, from the, the group of um, uh, um, Rusty Gage uh, and Peter Mertens. Uh, where they showed how epigenetics erode and, and, and make your neurons uh, more they differentiated, et cetera, and linked that to Alzheimer's disease. So, so aging and epigenetics is certainly an important element um, which you need to study. And then other environmental factors, um, there are a lot of studies showing that uh, if you keep your blood pressure okay, if you keep your cardiovascular situation okay, if you use your brain a lot, uh, if you work on your hearing, et cetera, that that prevents dementia, and that's very important. So that's the difference I wanted to stress in the beginning. Alzheimer's disease is a molecular disorder with specific players. Dementia is a symptom and covers a lot of different diseases. And so vascular dementia is probably one of the major forms of dementia and is usually associated also with the classical Alzheimer's disease. And so I think a lot of the data which show that you can modulate environment and improve your conditions has to do with this vascular dementia, in my opinion. So it's absolutely important. And from a health perspective, we need to take care of that. But to understand Alzheimer's disease, I think it will be very difficult to, to I don't think that we at this moment have, apart from aging, any clear external factor which is directly causing Alzheimer's disease. So, it can maybe accelerate the disease, can maybe influence the disease, but there is no external factor which causes Alzheimer's disease, as far as I know. Okay, and before we close, we have two more questions, and I would like to ask Velidakis to, to ask his question. 
Uh, thank you for a very exciting seminar. Uh, this may be known, uh, I don't know uh, because I'm not uh, in the field, but uh, what I found most exciting was that uh, when you transplanted uh, normal human neurons into an amyloid producing mouse brain, they got, uh, uh, they started dying. So that means uh, that uh, we shift to trying to understand how uh, extrinsically produced uh, amyloid kills neurons. Is that right? Is that the paradigm yes, shift? That's absolute. That's, that's really, I mean, that was the old fashioned amyloid hypothesis, which got completely, completely out of fashion. But these data basically show you that this is the case. Yes. Great. Thank you. <laughs> OK, and one more question uh, from uh, the student Karadina Karadoni, Katerina Karadoni. Do you think that necroptosis inhibitors could be effective clinically in patients with dementia? And if so, how the preserved dysfunctioning neurons should be treated? That's a very good question. Uh, I, I made even, maybe you didn't notice, but I made a, a, a cautionary remark when I showed you the data. This is very spectacular. Eh? We treat these mice. But that's again like, like uh, Vasiliki uh, pointed to. Um, uh, we, cured, we cured basically the disease in our model by giving this inhibitor. So for me, the most important thing here was that we demonstrate that the neurons die from necroptosis, also the ones which we cannot measure because they are morphological, not present anymore. So that's a scientifically conceptual demonstration. Of course, we were thinking about maybe that should be considered for therapy. But then the first question you have to ask is whether these neurons, which you stabilize, basically, uh, you make you, you take care that they don't form this, um, this milk, uh, which is also an amyloid, by the way, uh, this milk, which then permeabilizes the membranes, you basically inhibit the cascade so that that's not formed anymore. But you don't inhibit what happens upstream of that cascade. And so the whole question is whether there's something upstream of that cascade which makes your neuron already dysfunctional. And so that we, 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 we didn't check yet. So we are now developing, I told you how important electrophysiology is. We are now trying to measure, probably with calcium, the activity of the neurons in this mass brain. So you can probably do that with um, two photon imaging. And so what you would like to see is that we have a normal function of these neurons uh, under, under normal conditions, and then that they are dying, that they lose that, elect that calcium uh, function, that, that, that signaling function. And that by adding the necroptosis inhibitors that we can rescue that signaling in, in the neurons which are protected from dying. So that's the next step before before I would like to make predictions. On the other hand, these drugs have been used in the clinic to treat cancers. So maybe, maybe it's worthwhile to do a clinical trial and, and, and see what it gives, because at the end of the day, it's only what works in humans, which proves that it's, that it's, that it's real. So yeah, so my question is a bit a mixed bag. We don't know enough about it to predict what will happen, uh, but I think it's an interesting uh, track to follow. Okay, thank you very, very much, um, Bart. We let you go now to continue your excellent work. And thank you very much again for being with us. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. It was my pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank, thank you. And thank you all for joining. Thanks.